It's a thrill to be in this class session with you and to discuss the great person of Jesus Christ. But again, we don't want to discuss his person. We want to have him investigate us and know us and in that process begin to know him in a deeper and a more realistic way. I'm interested in an intimacy with Jesus. I'm interested in a flow of his life within me. I'm interested in being so open to him that he can come to be within me and change everything he needs to change so that I can know him in that kind of oneness of life. I long to know him like uh, the Apostle Paul talked about in being crucified with Christ, that I might not live, but his life might live in and through me, and that that life of Jesus might be made manifest through the faith that I have in him. That's what I really want. And I want that for you, and I want that for this class. So this is not a class to investigate uh, the literature about Jesus or the theology about Christ, but this is a time to literally stare into his face and experience him literally coming and revealing himself to us. Oh, to know him in all the fullness of his own being. Oh, to experience him in the reality of his person. Oh, that he might make himself visible among us that we might embrace him. It's the goal of this class. We want to do that, of course, by getting into the Word of God. For it's in the Word of God that His revelation comes to us. And we are concentrating on Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2. Uh, these two chapters, of course, at the beginning of Matthew, set the stage for everything that's going to happen in the rest of the book. They are the foundation upon which Matthew is going to build. And everything he's going to say is going to spill out of these two powerful chapters. Uh, they are the foundation. I want to ask you a question about your saturation. We of course are emphasizing this a lot in all of our classes because it's the key of our investigation. Uh, how about your saturation? Uh, how is your saturation in the Word of God going? I want to also ask you how is your saturation in His presence going? Because you see they work hand in hand again and we want to emphasize this again uh, for you to really get a hold of. You see, it's as I saturate in His presence that I saturate in His Word. And it's as I saturate in His Word, I saturate in His presence. And they are so intertwined that you can't divide them. And that's the dynamic of the living Word and the written Word. See, the living Word lives within you, and He's the author of everything that He said in the written Word. And He alone can take the written Word and bring explanation and revelation uh, from it. Oh, anybody can take the Greek language, study the Greek, can study the Bible in a literary way, an academic approach. Anybody can get truths out of it, ideas, concepts, and outline it, sharpen their theology, all of those kinds of things. Get ceremonies, set up a church organization, operate a big program, tell others, lecture it. Anybody can do that. But see, to get into the Word of God and not only devour the Word of God intellectually, and from a literary viewpoint, and from an academic view, but to have the Word of God in all of its living function, the living person of Jesus, begin to express Himself out of that Word until you literally embrace Him, and He becomes alive within you, and you begin to know Him, and you begin to know about Him things you could not know except He Himself reveals them to you. See, who can know the deep things of God except the one that has the very Spirit of God within Him? See, God has literally taken the foolish things of this earth to confound the minds of men that we might know Him and know Him in intimacy for He is the very wisdom of God. So this is what we're all about. We're all about the saturation in His person and the saturation in His Word. For in the saturation in His person, His Word comes alive to us. So I hope that you've been taking chapter 1, chapter 2 of Matthew I hope you've written some of it down. I hope you've carried it around with you. I hope you've prayed over it and, and ached over it and read it again and again and again and again. And you've saturated, saturated, saturated. Again, I say, saturate, saturate, saturate until you breathe it in and breathe it out. And He becomes a part of your mind and your heart. And you begin to see the Word unfold. And, and as you see the, the Word unfold, you literally begin to experience Him and know the depth of who he is, Christology. It's what he is all about. It's knowing him. So we're anxious for that to take place in this classroom. So I want to encourage you in your saturation. Keep saturating in Matthew chapter 1 and 2. 
Again, these two chapters are so important and we're going to spend all of our time on them because it's here that you literally begin to see the foundation for everything that he's writing. Matthew, as you know, is writing to the Jews. He's trying to convince them that Jesus was and is the kingly Messiah. You discovered this in discovering the purpose of the book. So everything that's going on in the book comes under the umbrella of this one purpose. Every paragraph, every verse, everything he says fits into this one supreme idea that he might be an evangelist. He's acting as an evangelist. I like him for that. And he's trying to convince the Jews of his day that Jesus Christ was and is the kingly Messiah and he's giving explanation of the whole thing. Again, he's acting like a lawyer, stacking evidence upon evidence upon evidence, saying, hey, you've got to deal with this. Here it is. Here's who the Christ is. Let it explode in your face. Let it grip your life. Let the reality of it become alive in you. This is what he's trying to say to us in this book. So chapters 1 and chapters 2, chapter 1 and 2, they become the foundation for which everything else in the rest of the book is going to flow. If you don't understand uh, chapter 1 and 2, you won't understand the rest of the book. You see, chapters 1 and 2 are all about the birth of Christ. And it's in his birth that you begin to understand the very basis of the flow of his life. If you don't understand his birth, you won't understand his life. If you don't understand his conception, you won't understand his crucifixion. If you don't understand what's going on in him in the birthing process of his very life, the source of his very existence, then you won't understand the dynamic by which he flowed and operated and the reality of truth that he's displaying to us in his fullness. So see, chapter 1 and 2 really become important to us. Now we want to saturate in chapter 1 and 2. But as this whole thing begins to unfold for us, and especially as we move into the next class session, we're going to ask you to also saturate in the context of uh, this, these two chapters. Of course, there is a context that follows. There's all of these chapters, 28 of them, 26 of them following these two chapters. And there's also what went on before. So in the next class session, we're going to ask you to saturate in what went on before. The reason that, for that is because the context is very, very important for us. For it's in the context that we begin to understand the passage that we're actually working on. So if you're going to understand chapter 1 and 2, you're going to have to understand what went, on it be, what went on before and the context out of which it flows. That really becomes essential to us. Uh, one of the great Bible scholars has said that you find out more about a verse by studying the context of that verse than you do by actually looking at the words of the verse itself. So what he's saying is, not, th not that the words of the verse aren't important and significant, but what he's saying is that the context literally gives you a basis by which to understand the words. And you will discover more of what he's trying to say by understanding what he, what he says from where he's coming from, what the cultural environment is, what it's flowing out of. You'll understand the attitude of what he's saying then and the intent of what he's saying, the motive, what motivated him to say it. All of that's going to come from the context. So we're going to ask you, uh, for the next class session to saturate in the context of where these two great chapters have come from. And of course, you know that the context is the Old Testament. So that's going to be our focus in the next class session. Uh, today, we want to actually get into and do kind of an overall survey of the Christology that's presented to us in these two chapters, Matthew 1 and Matthew 2. As you begin, of course, because you've already saturated, you know this, that he begins with the great genealogy. And the genealogy goes for actually 16 verses. And then he do, does an unusual thing. He literally takes one verse, verse 17, and he summarizes everything that he's already done in the genealogy. Now, I know that you can read the genealogy and yawn your way through it. Uh, in fact, I can't even read the genealogy. That is out loud because I can't pronounce all of the names that are found in the genealogy. And it gets a little redundant as you just go from one person to another person who begot so-and-so, begot so-and-so, begot, 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 and on and on it goes. And so we've kind of skipped over the whole genealogy thing. 
But as you saturate, I know that the living Word of God is going to give you something of His written Word. And the genealogy is going to become alive to you and in you and for you. So I'm really inviting you to saturate in the genealogy. Now don't get bogged down in the names and, and all of the characters because you can really get sucked into that and never get out of it. But I want you to stand back and, and look at the overall view, look at the overall significance of the entirety of the genealogy. Did you notice how he starts with the whole thing? He says, this is, verse 1, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, that, literal, that immediately begins to give you the literal design of what he's trying to do in the whole genealogy. That, that begins to open it up right there. Did you notice that he starts with the son of David, the son of Abraham? Then, of course, he moves into the genealogy, Abraham begot Isaac. Now, that seems a little strange, doesn't it? You would think, of course, that David obviously is going to be mentioned in the genealogy. And down in verse 6, you're going to see his name. Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon. So he's right at the heart of the whole genealogy of Jesus Christ. So that's, that's really no problem. But he starts out by saying, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Like the son of David is really going to be a strong emphasis of this whole genealogy. Now, you know why that's true. It's true because any Jew on the street of Jesus' day, any Jew that Matthew would be writing to, who would pick this up and would read it, would first of all ask a question right off the bat about Jesus' claim for Messiahship. For instance, if you went up to a man on the streets of Jesus and you would say, I want to talk to you about a man who says he's a Messiah. Oh, the first question, without batting an eye, that this individual is going to say to you is, uh, what about his genealogy? Give me his pedigree. Who does he come from? What is the tribe that he is associated with? Who are his forefathers? See, that was really important to them because they all knew from the biblical context of an Old Testament that the only one who could be a Messiah would be one who came through the genealogy and the lineage of King David. The reason is because this Messiah King, by the way, the Old Testament Hebrew word for Messiah means to smear or to anoint, which is all about kingship. So the, the basic belief was that the king of the kingship, the Messiah, who was going to come and deliver Israel, was going to be the king. He was going to sit on the throne, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, in order to do that, of course, he was going to have to be of the lineage of King David. That was absolutely essential, had to be. So the first question, the first test, the automatic, the beginning step in the claim to a messiahship was, hey, do you pass the test of being of the lineage of David? So Matthew was saying, let's get that under our belt. Let's get that settled. Hey, we won't need to discuss that anymore. Jesus Christ is of the lineage of David. He is son of David. Now, he follows that lineage all the way through, highlights King David, giving that absolute proof. Then he comes to the end of the genealogy, which is verse 16, and climaxes, of course, with the great person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the climax of the entirety of the genealogy. But he doesn't quit there. See, verse 17 then is a summary of everything he's given. Uh, in fact, look at verse 17. So all the, gen the, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Now, there's a whole study in this on its own. We'll only want to mention it. And it's that he takes the Jewish history and slices it into thirds. 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. 42 generations are, and of course there are people who literally are left out that should be in here. There are gaps in the genealogy as you study it. But he literally divides it into 14, 14, and 14, covering a span of 42 generations. 
And Jesus is the climax of all of that. Oh, there's so much truth in that. You could just run wild with that. God took a long time. God planted and plotted and planned. And he brought about the significance of the birth of Christ. The birth of Christ was not an accident. didn't just happen. It is the long-range plan of the dream and the strategy and the heart desire of God himself. Now, Jesus Christ is on the scene. He has come, the fulfillment of the plan of God. So the great summary is given in verse 17. Now he begins then in verse 18 with a whole new thrust. In fact, verse 18 begins the first narrative of the Christmas story. There are going to be four of them. The first one is given at the end of this chapter from verse 18 through verse 25. And then there are three of them given in chapter 2. Now these narratives are the Christmas narratives. And they are narratives giving us, of course, the information concerning the birth of Jesus Christ. So you can see the layout then of these two chapters. First you have the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It goes 17 verses. Then four distinct narratives explaining the very birth of Christ and what took place. That becomes the significance of the two chapters. Now you understand that the chapter divisions and the verse divisions were not divinely inspired. So the fact that the division of chapter 1 comes at the end of verse 25, the first narrative, is not of divine inspiration. We put the chapter divisions in there. We divided it up, not God. So the verse division and the chapter divisions are our invention. And they help us, but they're not always quite correct in dividing up the material. So you can see that as you really get into this material and as you saturate it in it, that really chapter 1 should probably end at verse 17 and that the four narratives of the birth of Christ should literally be lumped together in chapter 2. Now, the reason these narratives are so important is because they literally set the stage for the whole unfolding of the rest of the book. And he's ending the summary, he's ending the genealogy on the summary that he's going to march into these four narratives. So the narratives become the threshold, they become the lens through which you need to see all of the rest of the book. Now we haven't got time to develop this concept, but look at verse 16. It's the end of the genealogy. He says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of who, whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now when you get into the grammar structure of that verse, you will discover that he's just taken a gigantic knife and he's just sliced Joseph completely out of the picture, which is really ironic. You see, he's developed this whole detailed genealogy, again, 42 generations of it, and he's laid it all out and given you all of these details of who was involved, tracing it right down through King David. Then he thunders to the end of this thing, comes up to verse 16, and what does he do? He says, oh, really, it doesn't really matter because Joseph really didn't have anything to do with this anyhow because he's not really the father of Jesus after all. He's the legal father, but not the natural father. So he just sliced Joseph out of the picture. And he leaves you dangling with this, with this question in your mind, well, who on earth was the father of Jesus? Who was the natural father? If Joseph wasn't, what was going on? Was there an affair? What was actually taking place? How did it all come about? And what is the significance of what came about? Now, leaving you dangling, he's going to march you into this first narrative and give you the answer. And of course, if you hadn't read it or if you didn't know about the virgin birth, if this was all new material for you, you would march into this first narrative with an excitement and anticipation to see how all of this was really going to unfold and what it was all going to mean. And he does that for you in the first narrative. Now, the four narratives are narratives that are distinctly laid out. What we mean by that is, I don't want you to think I invented them or I divided this material up according to my whim or my desire. Matthew himself uh, set these narratives aside. And he did it in a very special way. He did it by 
starting each narrative with the same conjunction. It's almost like they're all set up in a, in a flow and in a contrasting flow because he starts each narrative with the same conjunction. Now, it's a conjunction that you're familiar with and in the English language, uh, we have different translations for that uh, conjunction. In other words, they can be translated in several different ways. The primary translation of this Greek conjunction that he starts all of these narratives with is the conjunction but. It's the strongest translation for the conjunction. Now, my particular translation that I'm reading from is the New King James Version. And he starts, it translates every one of these narratives beginning with the word now, which is kind of a watered down version of this conjunction but. But in the Greek language, every single narrative is started with the same identical conjunction, which sets them apart. It's like Matthew is highlighting them so that you can see the division, so that you'll get the emphasis and have handles to grab a hold of. Now, the first narrative, again, begins in verse 18 and goes down through verse 25. And as you get into this first narrative, you will discover that it, ha it comes from the viewpoint of Joseph. We're seeing the man's view of this whole thing. Now, that's going to be true of all of, all of the narratives in this, in this book. If you want the woman's view of this whole thing, you really need to go to Luke because Luke's gospel gives you Mary's perspective of what is happening. But Matthew's saying, well, let's talk about Joseph and his view. What was going on inside of him? What, was the struggles, what were the struggles that he was experiencing? How did this affect his emotions? What was, it, what was his reaction? What was required of him? What exactly was to be his response to this whole thing? Uh, what was the kind of interaction that was going on between him and, and the father uh, who was planning this whole thing? And uh, how is Joseph playing the role of the father of Jesus Christ? All of this is being seen through Joseph's eyes in his viewpoint. And it's a dramatic scene. Now again, the first narrative goes from verse 18 and climaxes at verse 25 of chapter 1. And it is, its emphasis is the king in his birth. See, Matthew is presenting at the very outset, Jesus Christ is the king. He has divine blood flowing through his veins. He is of the lineage of the King David, has the right to sit upon the throne. So a king is being born. You know that that's the emphasis of the birth process of Jesus Christ. So as it begins to unfold in this narrative, the emphasis is on the birth of the king, the king in his birth. Now the second narrative begins at verse 1 of chapter 2, and it goes all the way down through and includes verse 12. And this is about the king universal. And we want to talk a little about that, but we really need to go into a deep study of that because it's very significant. This section is on the king universal. Then the third narrative takes you from chapter 2, verse 13, and goes all the way down through and includes verse 18. And the emphasis in this is the king is above all evil. No evil can stop him. No evil can interrupt the plan. No evil can, can shut this thing down. This is the king of kings and he is bigger than all the evil that would conquer him. Then the last narrative goes from verse 19 down through verse 23 and it's the emphasis of the king as one of us. See, he has become our brother and even though he is a king, he is our brother and is one of us. What a magnificent truth this is. So there are, those are the four narratives. Now again, let me emphasize that we are seeing this story, these narratives, through the eyes of Joseph, how he views it. Let's go back and begin a surface look at the narrative, the first narrative. Now don't get bogged down in terminology, but as you begin to view this uh, paragraph, we want to title it. And again, words are not that important. You might want to title it something else and you have a better title than I do and that's fine. We don't care. Just so you grasp the concept of what's going on in this narrative. Now, I have entitled the first narrative The Emerging 
of Jesus. So this is really the king appearing on the scene. This is the king in his birth process, the emerging of Jesus. Now again, as you begin verse 18, he clarifies the fact of how Jesus was really born. In fact, in some sense, he's giving a second genealogy. Jesus is born of the Holy Spirit. And verse 18 is a, is a threshold over which you move out of the old genealogy that he's just given us, given to us, and he's moved us into a whole new phrase, into a whole new phase of the operation of this king. And you're going to see this unfolding as you march into the entirety of the rest of the book. But his emphasis is Jesus Christ is the king. Now the rest of the book is going to tell you what kind of king he is, give you content to that kingship. We're going to see servanthood kingship. We're going to see bleeding, suffering, dying kingship. We're going to see all of that take place. But here he's presenting us with the fundamental that Jesus Christ is born as the king, born of the Holy Spirit, has divine blood flowing through his veins. Now, how did Joseph respond to all of this? Of course, we know that Joseph is betrothed to Mary, and they are in that one-year period where they are not living together, but they are legally in contract with each other. And Mary is found to be with child. Joseph finds out about it, how devastated he really was, what this did to him. Oh, you cannot imagine. All of his hopes and dreams are, are vanished now. He's devastated. He's wiped out. Now, the scripture emphasizes in verse uh, uh, 19 that he, Joseph is a just man. He's a righteous individual. He wants to do the right thing, but he's in an overwhel overwhelming moral dilemma. What is the right thing? How can he react in a proper way? He's between a rock and a hard place. See, anything he does in this scene will be wrong. There is no way to get out of this scene the way it, the way it would be right to make things right again. See, Mary has blown the whole thing. It's a moral dilemma. He can't marry her. You see, if he marries her, he would be identifying with her sin. And he would literally be saying to the whole world, I am as sinful as she is because I'm the one that's created this sin and I'm the guilty party. He can't do that. He's a just man. So in his eyes, what, what can he think? She's had an affair. Um, she's been unfaithful to him. He, he doesn't want to put her to death. That would be a terrible thing to do because again, he's a just man. So what's the right thing to do? He's decided to give her a private divorcement. Just run away from her as fast and as far as he can. Wipe his hands of the whole situation of course, her child will be illegitimate. He will, he will never have any status. He will never be worth anything. He will be black male and black bald in the whole society. And her, she, she will never be married again. No one will ever want her. Um, she, she will be ostracized from society. It's a terrible situation. He goes to bed. An angel of the Lord appears. Oh, isn't that magnificent? An angel of the Lord appears to him in the night hour and give him, gives him distinct instructions on exactly what he is supposed to do. Now the instructions are found in verse 20 and 21 and they are, uh, they are special, they are particular. Tells him exactly what to do. For instance, in verse 20, Do not be afraid. Take to you Mary to be your wife for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. There it is again. See, Verse 18, born of the Holy Spirit, conceived of the Holy Spirit. That which is in her, verse 19, verse 20 rather, is conceived of the Holy Spirit. See, this birth of Jesus Christ is an action of God. See, the only way you're going to explain the birth of Jesus Christ is God is acting, God is moving, God is pulling off a big deal. This is a direct result of the movement of the Almighty God Himself. This is God's plan. God is responsible. God is the one that's bringing this about. God is the one that is pulling off and fulfilling his big dream. And Jesus is the fulfillment of that dream. In fact, he gets into prophecy then and tells us that this is all about God with us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Verse 23. And the whole story begins to unfold. And you come to the end of the story in verse 25, this narrative, and find that Jesus has been born 
and that Joseph has married Mary and has literally legitimized the, the, the birth of Jesus Christ and he is now called Jesus as he was to be uh, because Joseph has given him that name. And that's the first narrative. Now you move to the second narrative and again it starts with the conjunction. But after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, the old wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. So here we have the entrance of the wise men. Now, that's what we've entitled this narrative. Again, don't get wrapped up in terms. You may have a better title, and that's fine. So the first narrative is the emerging of Jesus, the king. The second narrative is the entrance of the wise men. They come into the scene. Now, this is really a significant scene. The wise men have, been, uh, have, have received the announcement from the star. And there's a whole study that needs to be done and we will get into this and begin to uh, saturate on who they were, where they came from, what they were all about, and what contribution they're actually making to this whole kingship of the person of Jesus Christ. But they have had the announcement from the star. Provenient graces took it, taken place and God has announced to them through the star of the birth of the king. Now, the indication of the scripture is that they didn't follow the star to Jerusalem. The star didn't lead them. The star appeared and then disappeared, and they hadn't seen it for quite some time. And as you get into your saturation, you'll see this truth beginning to appear. So they really were not aware of a star leading them to Jerusalem. They wandered around for quite some time. Also in your saturation, you will begin to discover that this covered about a two-year span probably a year and a half to two years was covered in this search that they were on and that Jesus all this time was in Bethlehem and by this time was in a house. So when they actually found him, they came to a house to worship him. And he was probably a year and a half to two years of age. So some time had taken place. So this was a long journey that these wise men were actually involved in. And that's remarkable in itself. They finally ended up at Jerusalem. They finally got the message that this is a Jewish king and that he would be born probably in Jerusalem then. So they came to Jerusalem. The scripture indicates that they went up and down the streets grabbing every individual they met and inquiring of them, where is your king born? Where is your king born? Because obviously, if the city of Jerusalem and the Jews had a brand new king, everybody would know about it and they would know where he is. So they just expected everyone could tell them and yet they found no answer from anyone. By that time, over their enthusiasm, King Herod heard about it, because he had his spies everywhere, you know, and they reported to him, oh my, some men have come, and they're saying that a new king has been born, a new king of the Jews, and they're looking for him. So Herod gets all upset. He's disturbed in all Jerusalem with him, and of course, he calls the wise men in. Now, Herod had sense enough to go to the church, the Bible scholars, the scribes, to find out where on earth this king was going to be born. And of course, prophecy then enters into the whole picture. And in verse 6, you find out he was going to be born in Bethlehem, which is just a few miles, about five miles, outside of Jerusalem. Uh, so when Herod finds that out, he calls the wise men in for a secret meeting, verse 7. And oh, this whole section is filled with hypocrisy and, and this deception Herod is trying to deceive them and he's acting like he's really interested and he's saying, oh, wise men, you go to Bethlehem, find this king, then come back and tell me where he is because I want to come and worship him too, you understand. I'm as much involved in this as you are. Oh, I have a heart like you have. You've been seeking. I'm seeking. Hey, you want him. I want him. You want to worship him. Oh, I want to worship him. And he's totally insincere, of course. And the wise men now are going to go. They find the Christ child. The star appears again and leads them to the exact spot, the house where the young child is. They go in, worship him, and give him gifts. And this then forms the second narrative. The interesting thing about this narrative is the injection, of course, of the wise men. And again, in your saturation, we are wanting to go back and find out exactly who they were, where they came from, at least as close as we can. And what you find out, of course, is they were pagans. Isn't that interesting? 
They were pagans. Uh, they were not Jews. They didn't have the Jewish ceremonies. The, Jew they, the prophecies were of the Messiah were not given to them. They're not the chosen of Israel. See, they're not, they're not the in crowd. Isn't it significant that this out crowd is now coming to the in crowd, giving them the information that a king has been born? Don't you think it's really interesting that outsiders, pagans, have come to the religious group, the insiders, the people of faith, and are giving them the announcement that their Messiah has been born. In fact, in Matthew's account, the first public announcement of the birth of a king, this kingly Messiah, Jewish kingly Messiah, was given by outside pagan people. Uh, somehow that tells me that God has a sense of humor. It's just ironic, is it not? You just want to slap your knee and laugh right out loud. That would be, that would be like, like pagans, like, like alcoholics and druggies coming to us half drunk, telling us about how to be saved. I mean, what have they got to say to us? I mean, what do they know about it? I mean, what could they contribute to us? They are outsiders. Pagans have no insight. But here they are. See, Matthew is injecting, even at this beginning stage of his gospel, the truth that he's going to hound all the way through, that Jesus Christ is a universal king. See, he's not a little Jewish king with a little minority group that he's going to sit on a throne and pat their little heads and they are going to be the chosen of God and everybody else is going to be cut out. Oh, Jesus has come to redeem a world for God so loved the world and that the impact is that he is king over every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. He is the kingly Messiah. He is king of kings and lord of lords of every nation and, and of every tribe and of every kindred. He is the universal king. He's injected that into the second narrative in such a strong, bold fashion, saying to us, the kingly Messiah is a universal king. Now you also pick up hints of this, this in the genealogy, because as you saturate in the genealogy, you will begin to discover that people are in the genealogy who shouldn't be in there. There are Gentile females in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Can you believe it? Saying to us what? Hey, this Jesus, his, he, this Jesus is of the lineage of the world. Don't you understand? He's not just a little isolated product of an isolated group. This is the act of God in redeeming an entire world. Jesus Christ is the king and he is a universal king. What an amazing truth. Now, the third narrative we want to go to. And as you begin in the third narrative, chapter 2, verse 13, it begin, begins with this conjunction. But, or as in my translation, now. Verse 13, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying. You see, an angel of the Lord had appeared to the wise men and had told them, don't go back and tell Herod. No, no, don't go back and tell him. Go home another way. And so Herod, when he finds out about this, probably took some time, but he finally found out about it. He was irate and disturbed. And so he pronounced an edict or gave a summons that all the, that all the baby boys, two years of age and younger, in Bethlehem and the surrounding districts should be slaughtered. So Roman soldiers literally went into all the homes, grabbed a hold of the heels of the, of the baby boys, threw them against the wall, and destroyed them. And there was a moaning and a groaning that went throughout all of the land uh, of Bethlehem and its surrounding districts. What an awful thing to take place. What an evil, evil thing to do. And as you march through this, you see the unfolding of this drama. God, of course, through an angel, warned Joseph, get out of here, get out of here now. Pack your bags. And that's what's going on in verse 13. Angel of the Lord came in the night hour and warned him. And Joseph obeyed, got up, packed his bags, got his family together, and that very night took off, fleeing to Egypt land where he would be safe. And they stayed there for the rest of the time of the reign of King Herod. Herod has pronounced an edict in verse 16, and all of the male children 
two years of age and under, are put to death in Bethlehem and their surrounding districts. districts. And you see the prophecy of that in verse 17 as it, as it unfolds. Now, we're calling this narrative the escape to Egypt because here the whole emphasis is upon the direction and the protection of an almighty God over his plan. Hey, his plan is not going to be thwarted. He is going to fulfill his dream. So you see the emphasis of this is that the king is above all evil. Evil is going to be dealt with by the kingship of this Messiah. You can count on it. Now to know the strength of this, you would need to saturate on the concept of who King Herod really is. See, they called him Herod the Great. See, they didn't call him that because he was fat. They called him that because he really was great. He had, was an immense, powerful person. And he had one of the most powerful reigns in Judah that any of the kings had ever had. He did things for Judah that nobody else had ever been able to do because of the power of his person and the power of his rulership. He was a powerful person. Now listen, when you can sit on a throne and simply give an edict, say the word, I want all the baby boys two years of age and under slaughtered, and not have to give reasons or argue with anybody, but immediately Roman soldiers march out and do it, you have a lot of power. Hey, Mary and Joseph are no match for that kind of power. But this Jesus, oh, this Jesus, the divine action of our God, this is no problem for him. This is absolutely no problem for him at all. He is going to conquer. And this kingly Messiah is going to reign and bring evil under his domination and is going to destroy it. See, what was prophesied clear back in Genesis chapter 3 is literally going to be fulfilled. See, yes, evil may bruise the heel of this Messiah king, but this Messiah king is is going to deal a death blow to the head of this serpent, the evil one. And evil is going to be banished and ultimately destroyed. His destruction is sealed in this kingly Messiah. This kingly Messiah has one overwhelming mission and it is redemption and the conquering of evil itself. He wants to do that in your life. Wow. What a message that is. Matthew is highlighting that, bringing it to pass at the very outset of this powerful, powerful treatise, this book of Matthew. So again, we see who this Messiah is. He is the king who has been born in the lineage of David, the kingly Messiah who's going to reign over all the earth. And he is the kingly Messiah who is a universal king. And he is a kingly Messiah who is bringing all evil, all evil under his domination. Now, of course, that brings us to this final, final narrative. And it begins in verse 19 and goes to, down through the end of chapter 2, which is verse 23. Now, uh, chapter one, 2, rather, verse 19, uh, begin, uh, begins again with this conjunction. But, and in my translation, now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph uh, in Egypt. So the angel of the Lord has appeared to Joseph again after several years have gone by, Herod has now died, and so the angel says, hey, it's okay, you can pack your bags, you can come back into Palestine. So, of course, uh, as they begin to come back, uh, the angel appears to him again. And it's a, it's a uh, narrative with a double warning contained within it. And in verse 22, uh, the angel tells him, uh, probably an angel, it says warned by God, but that's been the pattern throughout all the narratives. Uh, the angel in a dream, God in a dream, warns him uh, not to go down into uh, Judah uh, because he really needs to go and take the Christ child up into Galilee because the son of Herod is reigning and he's, he's as evil as Herod is himself. So they turn aside and they go up into Galilee and they end up in the hometown of uh, Joseph and Mary, which of course was Nazareth. And all of this was done that it might be fulfilled what was prophesied. And what is it that was prophesied? Verse 23, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now this is really significant, that he would go up into Galilee and to Nazareth. You see, down in Judah, 
um, and you will understand this from such a reading in the scriptures. Down in Judah, there is, uh, well, everybody who's anybody lives in Judah. It's the hubbub of the heart of all of Judaism. It's where the temple is. It's where God dwells. It's where the seminary is. It's where the school is. It's where the boys who write the fat books are. It's where the scholars are. It's where the PhDs are. See, it's the hub of real Judaism. It's where real purity is. It's where God dwells. See, Judaism, uh, Judah, Jerusalem, that's the place. Now, Galilee is north. You've got three providences. You've got Judah, you've got Samaria, and then you've got Galilee. And Galilee is way up here, their hometown, Nazareth. That's something like 80 to 100 miles away from what's really going on. And, and what kind of people are they up here? Well, they're common people. See, they got dirt under their fingernails. They're fishermen. They're uneducated. They're unrefined. Isn't it interesting that Jesus was not raised down here at the heart of Judaism, the scholars, the real scene. He was raised clear up here where the common people, the everyday, the run of the mill, the fishermen, the uneducated, uh, those kind of people are. Jesus chose 11 of his disciples from Galilee. They were all from Galilee. Because that's the kind of Messiah king he is. See, Matthew is trying to tell us something even here in this last narrative. He's telling us that this king is one of us. He has joined us on our level. See, he's not come as uppity up. He's not come as king over us. Oh, yes, he has. But he's come as our brother. He's come as one of us. This King of kings and Lord of lords has wrapped his arm around us and he is our brother. He's from Nazareth. And you know what Nathaniel said about Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? See, he came from the kind of hometown I come from. He came from the kind of stock that I was born of. Common people, ordinary folks, just run of the mill. Nothing special going on here. That's the kind of upbringing. That's where he comes from. See, he's really one of us. Really, really one of us. Oh, what a message he's telling us. Now, we've labeled... Uh, titled this particular narrative, the last one. And again, don't get caught up in phrases and words and fight over that. It's not worth fighting about. But we have, we have entitled this The Excursion from Egypt. So you've got the emerging of Jesus, first narrative. You've got the entrance of the wise men, second narrative. You've got the escape to Egypt, third narrative. And now you've got the excursion from Egypt as they come back into Palestine and settle in Nazareth to fulfill prophecy. Now again, you, you look at this and you begin to get a feel for who this Jesus is and how Matthew is going to present this Christ to us in the rest of the chapters. This becomes the threshold over which we're going to walk into everything else. See, grasping these concepts now is going to give you the basic interpretation of how you are to see the whole rest of the book. See, Jesus is the king. He's born of the lineage of David. He is the king who's been born among us. And he is a universal king, no question about it. He's going to reign over every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. Even the Gentiles are going to be brought under his domination and kingship. He's a God who loves the whole world. And he is a king who is literally above all evil and is going to conquer evil and bring redemption from evil. And he is a king who is one of us with his sleeves rolled up from common stock with a common name. He's one of our kind. He is one of us. What a Jesus we have on our hands. This is our Christ. He is the King, the Christ, the Lord God. I want to know Him. I don't want to just learn facts about Him. I want Him to literally come into our class. I want Him literally confront my life. I want Him to bring revelation of Himself to me. I want to see Him in all of His fullness. Um, this is the impact of chapter 1 and chapter 2. So we want you to keep saturating, keep saturating in the Word of God. And as this class comes to a close, I want you to focus on this Christ, the living person and the written Word. And I want you to saturate in both that He might reveal Himself to you. Um, have 
powerful times of saturation in His Word. Thank you.